technical announcements and then we'll get this started. Um, all the lines have been muted. We ask for everyone to please stay muted uh, during um, the rally, but please feel free to express your comments and support for the speakers in the chat function. If you have, for the reporters on the line and also for anyone else, if you would like to ask any questions of the speakers, please private message in the chat, MJ Okma, O-K-M-A, uh, from HSC, who is listed as uh, one of the Zoom co-hosts. He's gonna be aggregating and submitting the questions for us to answer at the end of the rally. And then finally, for everyone joining today, thank you again. We're um, going to ask towards the end of the rally for people to turn on their cameras at the end so that we can take a couple of photos. Uh, if you haven't made a handy little sign like you would have at City Hall, please do so during the rally. Um, we're gonna take a couple of photos, have everyone hold up their signs um, with save indirect funding, nonprofits are essential, whatever you know, floats your boat. And we'll do a couple of pictures so that people will really feel the in-person uh, vibe um, <laughs> that we're trying to achieve over Zoom. So again, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, I want to turn it over to Council Member Ben Kalos. I want to thank him so much for his leadership on contracts, um, the issue closest to my heart <laughs> and to many of ours. Thank you so much for your leadership and for organizing, organizing us here today and getting such a great turnout. I want to start with thanking you, Michelle Jackson, for your leadership at Human Services Council. Uh, I also want to thank all the folks you'll be hearing from today, Wayne Ho at Chinese American Planning Council, Janelle Ferris, Executive Director and President at Brooklyn Community Services, William Scarborough uh, at the Fortune Society, Joanne Page, President and CEO of the Fortune Society, uh, Rodriguez Sanchez Camas from uh, NIMIC, uh, Ariel at Safe Horizons and uh, Fred Shack, uh, Chief Executive Officer over at Urban Pathways, who's helped me with my dream of opening more supportive housing in my district. Uh, we, I, I also want to thank, we'll be joined by a number of elected officials, uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, my predecessor as Chair of the Contracts Committee, Council Member Brad Lander and uh, someone who's been on every single issue even before I was born, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who we hope to hear from soon. We're seeing multiple crises. We're seeing a public health crisis brought on by coronavirus and a global pandemic, triggering an economic crisis, leaving one in five New York City residents unemployed. All this on top of a longstanding crisis in race, equity, and criminal justice. At a time like this, when New York City residents need help from our nonprofits who have been there on the front line since the start of this pandemic, helping youth, seniors, our hungry and homeless, the mayor has not only cut funding going forward, but refused to pay the bills for last year. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalis. I represent the Upper East Side, Roosevelt Island, and El Barrio. I'm also chair of the Committee on Contracts. I am devoted to ensuring that every nonprofit gets the full funding they need, and even gets paid on time, which seems like a far fetch, but people should get paid on time. I also wanna share that this is personal for me because when my family needed help the most, uh, my local settlements house, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, was there for us, and they need to be there for every New Yorker. New York City has a long history of underpaying for nonprofits to help our neediest, ignoring costs like rent, heat, power, hot water, and other indirect costs forcing nonprofits to fundraise for the rest or go under. Last year, thanks in part to advocacy from council member Helen Rosenthal, my predecessor as contracts chair, the mayor agreed to finally fund indirect costs. Out of a $94 billion budget and a $17 billion contracts budget, both of those with a B as in billion, it only cost 54 million with an M to cover indirect costs. Then in April, the mayor proposed a funding cut of 40%, 40% from $54 million to $34 million on the guise of right-sizing, promising that the city saw fewer requests to cover these indirect costs than expected, and, this cost, and that this cut would not leave any nonprofits without funds. That was a lie. Now we are six months since, we've, uh, uh, since that statement. We are uh, only a couple of months after, I believe six weeks after we passed the budget, uh, nonprofits got an email saying that not only was the mayor not going to pay last year's bill, but we weren't going to get the funds moving forward. 
And that's certainly not what any of the people in the city council who actually voted for the budget thought they were doing. I voted against this budget because at a time that we were making cuts across the board for social services for our seniors and for our homeless and for our youth, we weren't seeing cuts in other areas of the budget. I'm not gonna go too far into uh, the fact that we can defund other city agencies. Uh, and in fact, I even identified $15 billion in cuts, including we could cut our corporate contribution, co corporate contracts with folks like KPMG who are getting probably more millions of dollars than we're talking about for the entire nonprofit sector to do things like a white paper on cybersecurity. Uh, so we should be cutting our corporate contracts before we cut our nonprofit contracts. And to this day, I still not have, have not heard from the mayor on this. And so we're going into a November budget mod. Uh, we've done letters uh, with many members of the city council. We're doing today's rally. And, and my vow to you today is to fight alongside you and fight, fight, fight through the November budget mod to make sure that as this mayor proposes cuts, that we actually cut from where we should uh, and restore the funding to our nonprofits that need it. And uh, for, for me, it's about the people that you serve, our kids, our families, our, our homeless and our hungry who need the support more than ever. Thank you for having me and I'll be here for the day. Thank you so much, Council Member Kalos. I really appreciate your leadership on this issue and for your understanding of how important something like indirect is to the, not just to nonprofits, but to the fabric of New York City and to the human services delivery system. It is what we always say is a wonky issue, um, but it's absolutely essential to nonprofits. Um, it's something that the administration claims to have understood, um, and we appreciate that the council, uh, with your leadership uh, and that of Council Member Rosenthal and also the previous chair, Council Member Brannon, do understand um, that the importance of of contracting and how that you know leads to services for all New Yorkers. And, Indirect funding isn't going to be front page headline news, except for, for the reporters on today. I hope it does make it onto the front page. Uh, it's absolutely crucial to human services organizations. Indirect funding is the roads and tunnels and bridges that make sure that providers have the structure that they need to provide life-saving services. Now more than ever, it should be really clear to New Yorkers how essential human services are to the fabric of our city. COVID-19 has shown that our workers are risking their lives and losing their lives every day um, since the pandemic started to make sure that people remained housed, fed, and taken care of. Those workers and nonprofits kept serving through the scariest times of the pandemic, making sure that people had the food that they need, had access to technology to be able to access friends and family, uh, and are now still on the front lines in recovery when it comes to things like eviction prevention and job training to help New York recover and get back on its feet. This funding, this indirect funding, is one step in paying providers the full cost of those services. To take away this funding, especially retroactively, puts this whole system in jeopardy and shows a complete lack of understanding or respect for the real life-saving work that our providers are doing every day. Um, this isn't business as usual. This, while it seems like in the scope of a billion dollar deficit uh, and a global pandemic, um, is, is essential to keeping New York running. A national study shows that in New York alone, 30% of nonprofits will close in the next year because of the COVID pandemic. The city, by cutting this funding, is accelerating that process. As providers were counting on that money in, in FY20, and this whole initiative was really based on trying to get providers some of the actual costs that, that they have um, in serving New Yorkers. And so um, appreciate, we have over 120 participants on today. We really appreciate all of you recognizing the importance of this effort. I wanna thank all of the speakers. I get the great honor of introducing you all uh, for taking time out of the day to talk about this important issue. Uh, and first up is going to be one of my absolute favorite people, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, who has been a great champion of this issue and getting it funded initially um, in, in making it sexy, <laughs> as she says, when we were you know, first advocating for this issue. Um, so thank you so much, Council Member Rosenthal, for joining us. Well, you know, right back at you, Michelle, there's no question that contracts are sexy. Um, they still are. 
So greetings, everyone. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. I am so pleased to be here with all of you today. I want to thank Michelle Jackson, the Human Services Council, Councilmember Kalos, and everyone here today who is standing with the New York City's uh, human services sector. Cutting funding to our social safety net in the middle of a pandemic and economic crisis is unthinkable. Now's not the time for austerity. We have other options, uh, such as borrowing, which I've been talking about quite a bit. And in the next uh, few days, the city council will be voting on my resolution, urging the state legislature to give the city borrowing authority. Uh, so I'm excited that at least we're moving forward on that. But as always, it's the nonprofit human service providers who are on the front lines every day, addressing New York City's most pressing social issues, one resident at a time. The city relies on these organizations to provide a range of critical services for 2.5 million New Yorkers annually. Services and emergency housing for the homeless, care for elderly residents, summer youth employment and mental health support, shelter and services for domestic violence survivors, support for children in foster care and more. Many of these organizations were already strained financially and now they face retroactive funding cuts as need for services only grows. The indirect cost rate funding initiative must be honored and fully restored. This initiative is critical to funding the human service sector appropriately. The only way we are gonna get through this time of crisis is by doing it together. City government needs to treat human service providers as full partners with a shared vested interest in ensuring that every New Yorker has the resources and the support they need. Michelle, thank you so much for pulling together this rally. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your support um, on this issue uh, and for really being able to um, understand and explain these issues uh, and, and understand the importance to, to the organizations in your district. So I wanna turn it over to um, one of my nonprofit colleagues to kind of really help illuminate to everyone um, what this looks like on the ground, um, this indirect funding, the importance of it, and then also the cut. So I'm gonna turn it over to Wayne Ho, the Chief Executive Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. And I wanna thank all the elected officials who are here today and standing behind the nonprofit sector. Uh, as well as all my colleagues that are here. It's great to see everyone. Uh, I'm Wayne Ho, the President and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. We're the nation's largest Asian American social services nonprofit. That means that we employ from our community, we serve our community, and we make sure that our, our community has equal opportunity during these tough times. And too often we hear from this administration that the social services sector is essential. We were told that our workers are essential. We were told our services are essential. We were told that we are essential to the recovery, to the relief as well as the recovery of New York City. And we saw that. Um, our staff put their, their lives on the line. They put their own families' health at risk by making sure that we could feed seniors. We made sure that we could run a regional enrichment center to support children of essential workers. We made sure that all of the underserved individuals uh, were getting home health care, as well as all our residential programs that we're continuing to make sure they were safe. And what's really hard to understand is how we are told uh, that we are essential, but this administration does not un understand what is essential to us. What is essential to us as a social services nonprofit is making sure that the full costs of providing these essential services are covered, and that includes indirect costs. Indirect costs is not just covering overhead and taking care of our rent or our utilities or facilities or technology, but this is also jobs. These are also people's lives that are affected when you don't support indirect. 
for CPC alone, having this 40% cut from last fiscal year means that we're losing out on $240,000 of money that was already promised to us that we jumped through lots of hoops with this administration, endless meetings, getting audits, paying thousands of dollars to our auditor to provide a letter so we could draw down this funding. And this is funding that would have paid for our bookkeepers, would have paid for some quality assurance staff, would have paid for uh, more IT staff, everything that's essential right now to making sure as we're reopening services, that things are safe, that people are healthy from our children to our immigrants, to seniors, to our staff. And unfortunately, this repeats a pattern of this administration of not valuing the human services sector. And there's a reliance on us to help everyone during the pandemic. Uh, this administration told us that individuals who are working in shelter programs and residential programs would, reserve, uh, would get hazard pay or up pay. And months later, we were told that that was gonna be reduced and we had to jump through more hoops. Uh, we had our summer programs cut in overnight. And that meant that young people and children weren't getting services and our staff had to be laid off or furloughed. Once again, impacting people's lives during tough economic and public health times. And again, they're doing that with indirect funding and we don't even know what's going on with FY21. So all we're asking for is simple, that this administration should come back and follow through on their commitment to the nonprofit sector. And we encourage all the council members to please continue standing behind us as we get into the, the November budget modification. Please continue to push for the full funding for indirect. It's not only what's essential to us as nonprofits, it's also essential to our workers and it's essential to the families that we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I now want to turn it over to council member Brad Lander who has joined us. Thank you very much, Michelle, for organizing this. Thank you, uh, Chair Kalos. Um, I want to praise uh, your work. I want to praise Councilmember Rosenthal's work on the indirect cost rate. Um, and it's a good to follow my friend Wayne, uh, who's doing such good work these days. Um, there's just a very deep hypocrisy here. Actually, let me start by saying, you know, before I was in the council, I spent my career in the nonprofit sector running two human service nonprofits. And my wife also is on her fourth New York City nonprofit uh, now, and is, of course, a big champion and, and supporter as well. But there's a very fundamental hypocrisy here that we just need to call out because so many of the services we're talking about are services that we have a city, as a city have chosen to provide through community-based nonprofits. Nonprofit organizations do so many important things, not all of them on city money. Obviously, there's an enormous amount of volunteer energy and philanthropic dollars and so many ways that nonprofits and human service providers provide essential support. But here, on dollars that the city is paying, those are services that we have said, we think it's best to provide these essential services, these meals to seniors, these services to after school, uh, to young people after school, this child care. We think a great way, the best way to provide that service with cultural competence in people's neighborhoods to build community capacity is to do it through nonprofit partners. Um, so that's saying, not only, as Wayne said, we think this is essential work, this is the kind of human service infrastructure that the city commits to provide, just like we do when we provide it through our own city agencies. And in many cases, we're saying this, we think, is a more effective and smart way to provide those services. But then we turn around and act like those are somehow like grants we're providing from the generosity of our hearts that you guys have sought. And that if we cut it, it's not that we're cutting services that we've said are essential, uh, but like too bad, so sad for you. And that is an appalling hypocrisy that we have to call out. And one way it shows up is in the conversation about layoffs. So we keep saying we haven't had layoffs yet in the city as a result of the budget cuts because we have not laid off city workers. And, and that is a good thing. But we have forced layoffs in the nonprofit human service sector with the cuts we made so far. Um, you know, those summer youth employment programs, we not only cut the jobs kids needed, we forced the laying off of the staff whose job was all year before that to run those programs. And we could give many, many more examples. And I know you'll hear more of them on this call. So let's be clear, we are acting hypocritically in, this, um, in the ways that we've acted so far in forcing layoffs. And then to add insult to injury by agreeing to increase the indirect cost rate and then turning around and cutting it in a way that we know will make it impossible for our nonprofits to provide the essential services 
that we've asked you to provide through contracting is simply unacceptable. So you have our support in the council. And I guess what this adds up to is if the November mod is a place where we are focusing on avoiding layoffs and focusing on resources for essential services, then we must collectively focus on and insist to restoring the full indirect cost rate as part of any agreement that's reached. We need that support from our state partners as they negotiate giving borrowing authority. We need that support from council members in insisting that we will not vote for or support a budget modification that does not restore the indirect cost rate to nonprofits. Um, and more fundamentally in the long term, that we understand that a recovery plan with and for our nonprofits is essential to the recovery of the city. So thank you for all the work you do. Um, apologies for the ways that our hypocrisy uh, fails to respect and strengthen and support it, and my commitment to work with you uh, and with Chair Kalos and with everyone on this call uh, to fight forward through the, the November mod and onward as we work to achieve recovery together with our human service nonprofits absolutely at its center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Lander. I really appreciate that, especially driving home the point that the sector is already facing layoffs um, and it has already laid off thousands of workers across the city. Um, so it's not an imagined set of layoffs. It is something that's happening now. Uh, and now I would like to turn it over um, to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and thank her uh, especially for um, the work on the letter that you'll see in the chat um, signed by all five borough presidents, which is such a huge advocacy effort and appreciate uh, that so much. So thank you so much, um, Gail, for joining us. Thank you very much, Michelle. I have the, uh, let me just see if I can, hold on one minute, yes. Okay, oh, no, hold on, there we go. I'm in a car, so I have to wear my mask. But thank you very much, and thank you, Chair Kalos, and my colleagues in the City Council. Um, yes, the letter was uh, a united effort, and I hope it helps. It was, it's not often that we do a five borough uh, letter. So that shows the importance of this issue. We all want the indirect costs to be paid. Number two, it's interesting to me because I am up and down Manhattan all day long, mostly now focusing on census. And we all talk about the COVID and Wayne and others talk so eloquently about the need for uh, workers in the nonprofit sector. But there's another, uh, it, you know, not good uh, aspect of all of this, which is the following, and why we need the nonprofit and indirect costs to be paid. Uh, just recently, I was on a call uh, with those concerned about affordable housing. And it was interesting to me that the city is not sure why uh, one shots are not being utilized. Millions of dollars are available. And I'm sure to me, because I know how it is with census, if uh, a group of individuals who don't speak English, who have other challenges, are not working with someone whom they are comfortable with, language-wise, culturally, age, et cetera, they don't fill out the census. And you know darn well, given what we're facing in Washington and so on, and the fear and hatred of government right now, for many reasons, people are not going to apply for one shots either. And guess what? They're gonna get evicted. So by not supporting the nonprofit sector in ways that funding could assist, you could end up with more people on the street. You are going to end up with less people filling out the census. And I don't need to tell you about the money that we lose. So there are many, many, not just amazing issues that Wayne Hole listed, but there are so many other ways in which not uh, completing the financial picture of the nonprofit sector is going to hurt us. I'm sure. The one reason people, I'm a, the best one-shot applicant you can imagine. I know exactly how to get it. You need the nonprofit sector to work with people in order for them to participate in government. And you're the only sector that they're gonna to listen to. So at the same time, as Wayne said, the human services providers are hanging on by a thread as you know, Michelle, better than anywhere. And you are tirelessly trying to fill the social service gaps these retroactive budget cuts are a slap in the face, not just of city, but of the entire five boroughs. You're not asking for a handout. You're asking to be paid for services that are contracted to provide. You had already been told you were gonna get the funding. You'd already agreed to all of the hoops that you had to go through. And it really devastates not just the workers, but everyone, as I just described. I think it's six 
six weeks after the end of FY 2020, and the city decides not to pay the 2020 contract, it's nuts. I think the nonprofits that the city is fortunate to have, they are getting shortchanged. These, as you know, housing assistance, mental health services, workforce development, food assistance, early childhood, homeless services, youth programming, violence prevention, immigrant assistance, and there are many other issues. All of these organizations offered a lifeline during the pandemic for health and housing and food, uh, made sure that people weren't isolated, uh, figured out how to transition to unemployment, thousands of phone calls for that, and of course, all the issues of trying to deal with the arts. I know that the DIFTA, for instance, those contracts are slated to receive only 60% of their indirect rate and only for some months of their fiscal year 2020 contract. Seniors have doubled down on the services, the programs that they offer older adults during the pandemic. Uh, you know better than I, but I certainly spent hundreds of hours making sure that the seniors get fed, as did everybody else on this call. And beyond this challenge, the senior services, as you have, have accommodated all those city hoops uh, and also you open cooling centers, uh, as Wayne Ho suggested, worked on the rec centers, and now learning bridges, childcare sites, which I'm not quite clear what you're supposed to do, but in any case, and I know you don't know what the funding is yet, yet these costs won't be reimbursed as promised. Um, I think for all of us in New York, we know that the direct service providers, the CBOs, you, the human service providers have put food on everyone's table you have provided housing and you've kept us connected to a larger community now and in the past the city not only owes you funding they owe you a debt of gratitude and obviously they owe the full funding of indirect cost rate as you had been previously agreed on both sides and i just want to close by stating that this community has been shortchanged in the past. We are not gonna get through the COVID without you. And the notion that you don't get the funding that you have been promised, as I indicated, is gonna hurt in more ways than anybody can calculate. So it's not only indirect funding, it's going to be all these ancillary ways, um, supposedly that the mayor doesn't wanna have challenges. He doesn't want people to be evicted, then you gotta fund people. So I'm here to say, um, be supportive as we can. And I'm glad that we got the letter done by the five borough presidents. And I look forward to getting the funding restored. And thank you very much for your advocacy. Thank you so much, um, Manhattan Borough President, for joining us and for, for all of your leadership in this issue for, for years. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think it's really important for us to hear from more nonprofits um, and thank them for joining us. So I wanna turn it over um, first to Janelle Ferris, the Executive Director and President of Brooklyn Community Services to talk about this, the impact on her organization. Hi, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I um, especially wanna thank the Lions here who got us the indirect rate in the first place. Um, being paid what it's worth, what your worth, what your value is, is what most for-profit businesses get to experience. And yet uh, our first opportunity, it seems, in the city of New York was last year. Think about it. What for-profit business would accept payment without the ability to pay their HR department, IT department, pay for maintenance, pay for, how do you run a business with less than what you deserve? And so I really appreciate hearing uh, uh, Councilman Lander talk about respect. And I also really appreciate Gail Brewer talking about the future, what this will do to us without the ability to pay for all of the things that we must do, including managing 12 audits at once. 
which is going on right now because the city wants to make sure that we spend the public's money well. Well, we are doing everything that we should do and doing it well because our people got up in the middle of the night to run the shelters throughout the epidemic, initially without PPE because we didn't even know it was necessary. And then we waited behind the hospitals with no drum banging for us. We say Black Lives Matter, those are our people in Brooklyn and as employees. And so I really appreciate the respect that indirect rates give us, but to rip it out after we have spent it, to do our jobs to the highest of our ability is an insult. and to ask us to plan a future without understanding how to do it because we don't know how much money we will get is an impossibility it, not to do it well and we all do our jobs well so i thank you all for this opportunity to fight shoulder to shoulder and I hope that we win because the people of New York City deserve better. Thank you so much, Janelle. Really appreciate that. Um, I also think we, it's really important for us. We're going to drill down now and, and talk to a worker at, at one of these organizations. Indirect, again, can feel very like amorphous. Um, so talking about the real implications on our organizations. Uh, we're joined by William Scarborough, who's the account manager in employment services at the Fortune Society. William, we can't hear you. Hi, sorry, can you hear me now? There we go, perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, uh, my name is William Scarborough. I'm an account manager with the Fortune Society. And uh, my job is to help people who have had uh, involvement with the criminal justice system, to help them to get jobs. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background so you'll understand why this is important to me. Before I came to the Fortune Society, uh, I was a state assemblyman serving a district in Queens for 20 years. Uh, so I know the difficulty that the elected officials are going through with budget cuts, but I also know that a budget reflects priorities and reflects what's important. And I hope that they will decide that funding these nonprofits is important. So like I said, um, I was a state assemblyman um, I made some bad decisions. Uh, I had to resign from my office and I ended up in a federal prison. Uh, I served my time and when I came out, uh, I faced a question that a lot of people in my situation do. And that is, what am I going to do now? Who's going to help me? The answer was the Fortune Society. The Fortune Society is committed to the proposition that you may make mistakes, uh, you may have been incarcerated, but once you are released, you paid your debt to society and you deserve the opportunity to be a productive citizen. So I started there as a client. I went on to become an intern and I was hired as an account manager. And so every day I get to see people who have made bad decisions, people who have been incarcerated often for uh, decades and they're looking to restart their lives. I have the job and the privilege of being able to help them to get a job, to help them feed their families, and to get their dignity back. Sorry, William, we lost you again. I'm sorry, there I we keep go. Uh, muting. Okay, okay. Uh, many of our clients, as I was saying, you know, have, may have been uh, incarcerated decades, and they come out, they're disconnected, uh, from many of the changes in our society, they need help with setting up email, they need help with housing, they need help with jobs, they need help with education. And that's what the Fortune Society does. We stand in the gap. We are helping this uh, people that need help at times when government is pulling back and cutting back. 
And so we cannot afford to take cuts now, especially in the time of this pandemic. Uh, as we uh, rightfully close Rikers and as we end mass incarceration, we have to provide the services that these returning citizens need. Otherwise, we are just feeding the criminal justice revolving door. And so one of the things that I knew very well when I was in government, and I see clearly now, we can either fund the nonprofits that are providing the education, the housing, the other services that our citizens need, especially our most vulnerable, or we can spend two or three times that amount to keep them in jail. I know everybody here is fully aware of that. I hope the elected officials will be able to convince uh, their uh, colleagues and the council and the mayor and to rescind these cuts. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you so much, William, and thank you for sharing your story. It's, I think, a really important to, to, to really put a face, literally, on, on these issues. So thank you so much for that. And now we're going to hear from Joanne Cage, the president and CEO of the Fortune Society. You know, one of the privileges of my 31 years heading this Fortune Society is the ability to have uh, staff and leadership that reflects the people we serve. More than half of our staff are people who are themselves formerly incarcerated. I have never seen anything like the level of need that we're seeing walking through our doors now, or the level of risk to the nonprofit providers who are the front line of being there for the most vulnerable people. And what Bill said, you either pay now or you pay later, and you pay much more, and you pay in lives lost and communities damaged and violence in the street and homeless people, and hungry people, and children who have no future. We cannot afford the statistic that Michelle cited, that a third, 30% of the nonprofits won't be there after the pandemic. But when I look at what we're facing, that may be conservative. With the need for IDC, this is a time more than any other where we need strong management, effective record keeping, strong data, strong IT, strong fiscal management, because these are times that are taxing us more than ever before. What I've seen at Fortune is that we had to close our site. We had to go remote. We had to open our sites again. We have to deal with the personnel issues that come with people being desperate. We have to deal with requests for accommodation. We have to deal with conflicting laws about, my apology for the background noise, with conflicting laws about time and leave, about uh, people's ability to take off, about ability to keep people with sick time. We are having to keep track of COVID expenses separately. We're having to communicate with our funders about changes in contract deliverables. We're needing to change our billing from performance based to line item. Before we were not paid for our IDC costs. The IDC costs have skyrocketed and the need to meet those requirements is now of greater risk. This is a time of tremendous challenge to the people that we serve. Fortune sees eight to 9,000 formerly incarcerated people. We're seeing an explosion of hunger, of homelessness, of substance abuse and mental health issues, of desperation, of jobs disappearing. Before the pandemic, the state prison system was releasing more than half the people who came to New York City into the shelter system. I don't know what's happening now. What we learned is that for those people most vulnerable, we could get them out early, or at least some of them. But if they had no address, they were not released. In the middle of the pandemic, we opened up new housing. I'm very proud of what we and our sister organizations have done during the pandemic. I think what we've been doing is heroic and the demands are only going to increase. But in 31 years of running the Fortune Society, I have never seen threats to nonprofits that look anything like what we're seeing now. In March, when we were most of the year through, as the pandemic required that we close our offices, Fortune had $13 million in unexecuted contracts. As we are now, and it's September, we have $17 million in unexecuted contracts. July, August, September, that means we haven't gotten paid for the work that we've been doing. 
the bargain we've had as nonprofits, and it's a terrible bargain, but one we learned to live with, was that we will get paid late. We will have to eat the cost of the interest for the money we paid to borrow, but we would eventually get paid. And that promise is no longer reliable. The IDC cuts are retroactive cuts. We relied on the funding, we spent the money, often we spent more than the money because the demands of the pandemic were greater. We do not know that we're going to get paid. And we have $70 million of unexecuted contracts. Here's the rock in the hard place. Do we close our program? Do we lay off our staff? Do we stop doing the services? And then start up again when the contracts kick in? Or do we do what all of us are doing? And that is keep doing the services, borrow the money, eat the cost of the interest, and pray that the bargain that's been made in the past that we're eventually going to get paid will be held because we are desperately needed. So there's a very simple thing that we're asking for. Pay us for the costs that we incur to do critical services. And for God's sake, pay us on time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanne. <laughs> I appreciate that. And so now I'm gonna turn it over um, to hear more from On the Ground with to Rodrigo Sanchez Camus, Esquire, Director of Legal Organizing and Advocacy Services at NIMIC. Uh, thank you so much, and, and uh, thanks, special thanks to HSC for their leadership on this and, and how much you've pushed this issue. And for our elected officials who are here today, I will try to keep this brief. Um, I think we've, we've talked a little bit about this, but I want to put some numbers on this for folks. We, we started some, some hotlines when we looped out uh, and the office closed. In, in that time, from, from late March until now, we have received over 15,000 calls. This far exceeds the amount of people that regularly come to our offices for services. Our, our primary service area is Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, and almost all our callers are from this area. The, the level of need has been something we have never seen before. We went from having a, a once monthly food pantry, we're now doing every, every other week. Um, we've already sent out over almost 40,000 pounds of food to our community. Um, Washington Heights was, was deemed a food desert before uh, the pandemic hit. Right now, we have people in our community who actively do not have access to food. Um, this is a crisis we're in, and for us to be having to spend our time and energy clawing back money that, that is money we need to, to provide these services at a time where we also have to rethink our service models. We have to invest in, in new service models that allow us to better serve our community at a time where we're losing money to do that. This is not feasible and, and we're not going to meet this need and these people that need us will not have us if we are not able to do the simple things like build out a new system to, to be able to meet people where they are, to be able to get the services to the community that needs it the most. So I think that what, what we need right now from the city is, is simply meeting your obligations. That's all. We're not, it, it, this is not asking for anything other than what, what we need to be able to, to help stabilize New York City and the folks in our community who need it the most. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And it, those numbers are really stark. And, you know, you multiply that by organizations across the city. Um, imagine, imagine the need um, that nonprofits are dealing with right now. Um, it's, really incredible. Um, now I want to turn it over to Ariel Zwang, the CEO of Safe Horizon. Thanks so much, Ariel, for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate all that the Human Services Head Council has done. It's great to see uh, our best friends in the elected official court. Thank you for all that you do for us as well. And, you know, colleagues who are just the best in the business. It's it's a pleasure, even for this reason, a pleasure to be here together. Going last or next to last means that almost everything that could be said has been said. I'm not going to repeat. Um, but I will just add 
that I find it cynical to imply that somehow funding to indirect is not a, a, a funding cut, a cut to services. Um, of course, indirect pays for all the critical things that my colleagues have described, uh, but I want to explain how not having those things has a direct impact on our services. For example, during COVID, in a matter of weeks or days, we had to shift tremendous amounts of our work to online uh, work or offsite work. So quote unquote direct funding, it doesn't pay for the computer support needed to home, host Zoom therapy sessions. Our counseling center is not in person. It's providing services remotely and all the, the tech support that requires, uh, that's required in order to provide telehealth services. Quote unquote, direct funding. It doesn't pay for the IT workers who made sure that Safe Horizon colleagues could file, help clients file for a restraining order remotely, believe it or not, we are able to do that during this pandemic, help people get an order of protection remotely, but we need that IT support in order for our uh, colleagues who are doing that work from home to be able to do it. Quote unquote, direct funding doesn't pay for the massive changes in the operation of our hotline that allowed our colleagues to work more safely. And we serve a hundred, get a hundred thousand calls on the domestic violence, crime victim, and rape crisis hotlines that we run for New York City every year. So I think, um, I think you get the picture. Cuts to indirect are cuts to services and imperil the health of every single agency that provides human services. So I urge the city to do the right thing and keep its promises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. And you did add new talking points. So I appreciate that. You covered things we haven't covered yet. I greatly appreciate that. And so last but certainly not least, um, I want to uh, introduce Fred Shack uh, from Urban Pathways, uh, who will help to close us out and has also really lent a lot of his time um, and expertise to this indirect uh, effort. So thank you so much, Fred. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to our supporters in City Council. Um, you know, Councilman Kalos and um, Rosenthal and Lander, it's, it's absolutely amazing to have such leadership um, supporting this effort. Um, and also for uh, Borough President Brewer uh, for the work that you've done over these many years to strengthen the city. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the controller um, for the support that he's offering um, during this period of time. Um, as indicated, my name is Frederick Shack, and I'm the CEO of Urban Pathways. And Urban Pathways is a city, New York City based nonprofit providing services in Brooklyn, Queens, uh, Bronx, and Manhattan. Uh, we serve chronically homeless uh, New Yorkers through provision of services, uh, including outreach at the airports in Midtown Manhattan. We also provide um, uh, chronically homeless adults with access to uh, safe havens and supportive housing. Our ability to provide these vital services relies on our outreach workers, our case managers, our building and food service staff, and our security monitors, all of whom are essential workers um, who continue to work on location during uh, COVID-19 while many New Yorkers sheltered in place. While the work that we do is critical to survival of New, of New York's most vulnerable individuals, um, our ability to, do, to continue doing those services is largely dependent on the support staff. Um, those individuals who manage payroll, um, the provide, uh, make sure that we have access to essential supplies. Um, as indicated earlier, uh, technology is critical, critically important. And also the ability to maintain and to manage the benefits um, for our employees. Historically, the city and state government have grossly, and I mean grossly, underpaid nonprofits for the vital services that we provide. And this underfunding has resulted in depressed wages uh, for those heroes who continue to work um, throughout the pandemic. In response, Urban Pathways has worked to advocate for a living wage uh, for all of our employees and will continue to do so. But as previously stated, those individuals um, who work directly with our clients really rely on the support of other employees, the support staff, and, and they also rely on the organizational infrastructure in order for them to be able to do their jobs well. 
Um, and government has for many, many years, and I, I'm talking, I've been doing this work for over 40 years, has underfunded um, the nonprofit sector specifically as it related to the indirect expenses that we incur. Um, and they've also set arbitrary caps with no relationship to um, reasonable costs. What other industry, as you now said, what other industry um, would accept 85% payment on the cost of doing business? If they tried to get a bridge built in, in the city and only paid 85% 80, of the cost, they would get 85% of a bridge. We can't continue to operate this way. So approximately two years ago, the city agreed to begin working with the nonprofits to create a consistent met method for establishing an indirect rate through the creation of a cost manual. Last year, um, the city agreed to reimburse nonprofits the full cost of the indirect expenses in accordance with that cost manual. Urban Pathways work with the city to format our budgets um, consistent with the rules outlined in the cost manual. We had our indirect rate reviewed and approved by the Mayor's Office of Contracts. We submitted um, our budgets for our budget modifications uh, for approval um, for the expenses that we had incurred through the period that ended on June 20th, and it was approved. For Urban Pathways, the underpayment was $800,000. However, in July, we were told by the city that they were going to re re reduce our reimbursement by 40%. Um, this is 40% on expenses that we had already incurred. And, and quite frankly, as of today, we're, um, we're one third into um, our we are a quarter into the first quarter, and at this point, we still don't have any indication what our reimbursement is going to be for the current period. We can't continue to provide these critical services if we don't have the resources to pay for our rent, our insurance, our employee benefits, like our health coverage, and for our IT. Uh, the city must make better choices. Uh, they can't continue to attempt to balance its budget on the backs of these needed New Yorkers. And, and once again, I really want to thank the elected officials. Uh, you don't know how important your support is to um, the organizations that we operate and to the citizens of the city. We serve over 3,700 um, homeless New Yorkers each year. And we know that without the support of organizations like Urban Pathways and the other um, entities that are working with this population, um, more and more New Yorkers would die on the streets of the city. So I thank you for your support and I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. So we're, um, we're wrapping up. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to give people an opportunity. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat. It looks like MJ hasn't gotten any questions yet. Um, I think we're all pretty briefed on the issue, so there may not be questions. Um, but we're going to give people an opportunity to ask questions in the chat while uh, you type any questions you may have or raise your hand and we'll try to find you in the sea of, uh, of videos. Um, I will do my closing and then we're going to take two seconds at the end and ask everyone to turn on their cameras so we can take a nice group picture. If you have a sign, hold it up. So, you know, get yourselves camera ready while I do my closing. And if you have a question, type that out too. Um, so in closing, I really just first want to, of course, thank council members Kalos, Rosenthal, Lander, uh, and Borough uh, President Gail Brewer for being with us today with a very special thank you to council member Kalos for organizing us. Um, and making sure that we're really keeping this issue alive um, when there are a sea of things for us to be upset about and concentrating on, um, this is a really important one. And so we really appreciate your leadership here. I also wanna thank the controller and the other borough presidents, as you've seen in the chat, uh, for letters um, and for them lending their support to, to this really important initiative. I also wanna thank our speakers today, Wayne, Janelle, William, Joanne, Rodrigo, Ariel, and Fred. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules um, and really for your passion in serving New Yorkers and for being able to, to explain so clearly why this funding is so necessary. Um, and finally, I really wanna take a moment to thank my members and all the human services organizations joining us today. You're really true heroes who show up every day um, before there was a pandemic and certainly during, cobbling together resources to give people a better life. You deserve so much more respect admiration and funding for what you do. I could not be more honored uh, to represent you as we continue this fight, to have the resources that we need to achieve real equity in the city and to better serve our communities. So I really wanna just thank you all so much for this opportunity to represent you today. Uh, for all of you who are joining us, we have a really great turnout. If this was in person, I'd be satisfied. So it's great to see such a great representation over Zoom. Um, I'm looking at the chat and it seems like we are still questionless which means 
Everyone turn your cameras on. Uh, we're going to take a couple photos to so just stare at your camera and smile. I'm going to switch to gallery view so I can see everyone joining us today. You have your sign. I have my sign. Oh, it's backwards. I just realized that. Um, I also have on my no procurement, no peace uh, t-shirt. <laughs> so uh, smile for the camera for a couple of minutes and we're going to take a couple photos of everyone. Oh, I like this. People are using their technology and their iPads. <laughs> We're letting Jason take some photos for us today. <laughs> all right. I, oh, I love these signs. I'm going to keep looking at them. <laughs> so thank you all so very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. We'll continue this fight. We'll have this posted. We're putting out our press release right after this. And stay tuned for more advocacy action because we aren't going anywhere. So thank you all so much. Thank you.